Right now I'd like to talk about um, some proof strategies. And as you go about how, how you would like to show things or prove things, whether we look at any of the stuff that we're looking at. And um, the first thing that you want to think about as we go about trying to prove things is you have to keep in mind the start and the end. One of the things that, you know, when I talk about this is when you try to show something, and I talk about the start and the end of it, you have to know where you're beginning the proof and know where you're ending the proof and what those particular things mean. And what both the start and the end mean in a problem. So for example, if we had something along the lines of if I would like to prove the following statement. If 3 is a factor of n then 3 is a factor of n squared. So if I was going through this particular proof, and so I have this if-then statement, and you're trying to work it out, it's like, not only do you, if, if I would try a direct proof, you'd have to assume n has a factor of 3, right? This part here is where you are starting. On the other hand, eventually you want to do a bunch of work, right? And get to the fact that you would like to show n squared has a factor of 3. And this is the ending. And you're going to have to eventually tie these two things together. But when I say you have to know what these mean, there is no point in even beginning a proof or throwing things out if you have no idea what it's talking about and no idea where you're going, right? If you want to start a proof, you have to know what I have and where, where do I want to go. And you have to keep both in mind at the exact same time. And now, this is true of all you know, kind of real life problem solving as you're going through particular problems. You have to deal with this fact that when I want to work with something, what does this, you kind of like here, n has a factor of three. What does that mean, right? Do you know what that means and can you represent it? n squared has a factor of, of three. What does that mean and do you know how to use it? You don't have to necessarily use this in proofs. This works in other examples. Uh, one of the examples that I I can give is I took a differential equation co course and the problem was given that you have a spherical buoy that is half submerged in water. You slightly depress it into the water, let go, and this thing is going to bounce. And then the question was, can you find the period of oscillation? So I'm like looking at this and I'm like, okay, spherical buoy, if I submerge it in water, then this particular shape of the material, right, will be submerged. It's a slice of a sphere, and that's going to be the water displaced, and that weight of that water is the restoring force to push this back up. And once it pushes it back up, it'll kick it off and form the oscillation. And so the big part of this problem was, could I figure out what the you know, I had to find the volume of this particular water to figure out the force that's pushing back on it. It's just a standard thing. And as I was trying to do it, the problem was this ended up being something that I couldn't integrate, right? This was non-integrable. And the other thing is it gave me no numbers. It gave me no values. And it's like how, I don't, I don't know how much it's been put into the water, is it half of it, all of it. And so... I would try to go through this and, and solve it. And solving differential equations, you know, means integration to go through it. I'm like, fine. It's an odd-valued problem. I looked in the back of the book. So trying to go forward, 
knowing what I had and the equations, I tried to go forward, you know, to, to work this out. And on the other hand, I didn't know where I was going, right? I didn't know what I was supposed to get out at the end. Now, the other thing that you can do on problems of this nature is keep in mind what do I have and what does it mean? And where am I going and what does it mean? And I was kind of stuck on the whole part of, I don't know how to do this. But if you keep both in mind, the second thing that you can do is you can apply what's called forward and then backward reasoning. The idea of forward and backward reasoning is this, like this problem. I had this, I could ask, okay, given this, move to so for example, step one, move to step two, and then I was stuck, right? I got to I got to a point where I couldn't do any more calculus. I couldn't do anything and I was stuck and so I could not move forward in nature. But on the other hand, because it was an odd problem in the book, out here I actually had the answer in the back. Right? And it gave me this really nice function. <laughs> To, that had to been the solution to the problem. And I'm like, I can't reconcile these two. This is a clean looking thing. And this this is a horrible looking calculus problem that I've done. So what's what went, went wrong? And so the idea of backward reasoning says, okay, I know it's improper reasoning to assume that you have the conclusion, but it wouldn't, it's not bad to think that if this is existed, I wonder if there is something that naturally would occur before it, right? And since this is a, a, it's kind of like you could go and just simply, can I check my answer? Checking the answer for integration problem would be differentiation to go backwards. And to ask, I wonder what would naturally occur before this? Well, it would solve the derivative and go through that. And then you would say, I would wonder what would go before this. And I would wonder what would go before this. So I kind of stepped backwards. The idea of forward and backward reasoning would be something like, drive from Wichita to Salina and I ask for a like Wichita State campus to the water park in Salina well it's not that crazy to say that well if you were at the water park in Salina the natural way to get to it in Salina would be at this particular road because it ends up at the water park and on the other hand this is a major road that leads to that road so I probably ought to have taken that one and well, and this is the interstate that gets to that road and they intersect each other and said, well, that interstate I can easily get to. It's I-35, sorry, 135. I just need to go down 21st Street down to 135. Then I'll get off at this exit. I'll follow this road and then I'll be at the water park. And then you would go through and actually do the forward reasoning. So backward reasoning is a question of before. On my example of the differential equation course, I took derivatives back and then checked it out and it ends up being that the thing that I missed, the only way that this could happen was they did not solve a sphere. What they had solved was a cylinder, which is straight edged. And a straight edged problem, well, that's easy to solve. And I'm like, well, how do they justify using a cylinder rather than a sphere? Well, if it's halfway submerged, that's right here where a sphere goes vertical anyways. And if I slightly depress it, then this bend is really not that far off of a straight line. And so it's not that bad of an approximation to use a cylinder rather than a sphere you know, on a slight depression of a spherical buoy. And so it was an approximate answer, right? It wasn't the literal answer, but it was an approximate and it wouldn't be too bad. And so what I then did is said slightly, I'm going to approximate it with the cylinder, and then I did the rest of the work and I got exactly what the back of the book said I got. So the idea of forward and backwards in proofs is this idea of given the beginning, let's march forward. You could possibly get stuck. Backwards says, well, all right, fine. If I did get to this, what had to happen? What possibly happened before it? And what possibly happened before it? And then you try to get what is the tie that exists between these two events? And then once you find that special tie, just like I found the special tie was the approximation by a cylinder. You go back to your proof and you find that, oh, this is my special tie, and you stop, 
you go back here and then you prove it going forward the entire way jumping across that tie it's like oh go a b c d e e f and you finish it off under your proof so that's the idea of applying this idea of forward and backward reasoning which absolutely requires you must know what you're talking about at the beginning and you must know where you want to go to at the end and how you get a path a intellectual logical path in between those two events and so like on this particular problem you know how would you do that how would i go about showing that if n is a factor of three then n squared has a factor of three how could you show what does the word factoring mean the third thing that we can do on proofs is adapt known proofs the idea of adapting known proofs is you've already done a proof and you know how to do it is this one similar to the other for example prove the square root of 3 is irrational right so proof well I've already done the square root of 2 so how much more complicated could the square root of 3 possibly be well so I look at this and say alright I'm going to prove the square root of 3 is irrational uh, square root of 2 we used uh, contradiction so I'm going to try contradiction so we're going to try contradiction which means that my end goal right what is my goal to at the very end of this is to show that square root of 3 square root of 3 is rational is always false right that's the goal of contradiction so this is where I want to go that somehow the square root of 3 is rational ends up being false now the square root of 2 is rational is false the tie on this was this idea of a common factor of 2 and no common factors to be irrational there aren't going to be common factors we can write this in simplest form so the contradiction was the square root of 2 equals a over b and a and b have no common factors and a and b have a common factor of 2 that together is always false so the opposite of it must be always true which would mean irrationality so we're going to try that so we're just going to go ahead and take the square root of 3 is rational which means that the square root of 3 is equal to some sort of a over b where a b are ints these are integers b is not 0 and more importantly a and b actually all three are absolutely important a and b have no common factors now given all that the next thing that we did was just square both sides and so I get 3 is equal to a squared over b squared and then I could multiply both sides by b squared because b is not 0 so that tells me that 3b squared is equal to a squared now if I look at that before we were using words like even and odd but what this is telling me is hey wait a squared is 3 times something and that's an int so that tells me that 3 is a factor of a squared so a squared has a factor of 3 so if we keep the same concept I bet there's going to be a lemma that would allow me to say that a has a factor of 3 as well right so we would have this lemma to go ahead and do that and because that's what happened with the square root of 2 right a squared had a factor of 2 therefore a had a factor of 2 normally we called it even but it just simply means factor of 2 so does such a lemma exist and I would have to stop right now because I'm stuck we'd have to go through this and say all right fine let's see if I can find such lemma so we need at this point a lemma such that a squared has a factor of 3 implies a has a factor of 3 right um, so I'm gonna have to do a little sub so I'd have to stop at that particular point I'm gonna have to prove this particular lemma because that's what we're gonna have to use so all right fine uh, proof of this lemma uh, we'll try contraposition 
which I'm rather going to prove A doesn't have A factor of 3 implies A squared doesn't have A factor of 3. Uh, for the square root of 2 proof, it was this. A doesn't have a factor of 2, which means A is odd. <laughs> Implies A squared doesn't have a factor of 2, which means that A squared is odd. Same thing, but we're using word factor rather than... So this is what we're going to do. And so we're going to assume A what? Doesn't have a factor of 3. And it now gets that if I want to prove this, I have to know what that means. <laughs> well, first off, a factor of 3, like a number that has a factor of 3, would be 3 times something, right? K and int. That would be a factor of 3. What would be not that? Well, not a factor of 3 would mean not this, which would mean that n is equal to 3k plus 1 or n is equal to 3k plus 2. Because multiples of 3 are always, there's a middle, there's a plus 1, like, what are the multiples of a 3? 3, 6, 9. So how do I get to 4? 3 plus 1, how do I get to 5? 3 plus 2, right? How do I get to 7? 3 plus, 3 times 2 plus 1, how do I get to 8? 3 times 2 plus 2, right? So that means this is the not factor of 3. So really what this problem does is become two cases case number one and case number two right and so for case number one i would have to show that well if i had a 3k plus one when i square it is it going to be three times an int plus one or three times an int plus two and on the other hand if three times k plus two if i squared it would it be one of those as well? 3 times something plus 1 or 3 times something plus 2? And you could check these particular things out. So we'd still have to check it. But on the other hand, let's say that you have to, you, let's say you did finish. By the way, this is your attendance problem. For Monday. All right, so you're just going to finish this particular proof. And let's say that the lemma has actually been proved. And so now we can go that, okay, a squared has factor of 3, then by lemma, a has a factor of 3. But that means that a is equal to 3 times k for k and integer. Well, that would give us then that... 3b squared equaling a squared becomes 3b squared is equal to a, which is 3k squared. But that tells me that 3b squared is equal to 9k squared. But that tells me that b squared is equal to 3k squared. But hey, look, 3 is a factor of, so b squared has a factor of 3, which entails us by the lemma which you're going to have to prove yet, b has a factor of 3. And so what have we, what have we learned? a, b have no common factors, and a, b have a common factor. of 3, which is logically false. So square root of 3, <laughs> square root of 3 is irrational. Hey, look, I found a second irrational number. And we're done. And so the big variant on this is obviously the lemma gets modified a bit, and we have to use words like factor. But in the end, the concept is still the same. And so that's one of the ways that we do proofs, right? We, we look at some known classic proofs, and we always use that. We look at that thought technique, and we use that for problems that are similar to it. And so we can modify known proofs. All right, so we can we always have to keep in mind where we're, what the start would be, what the end would be. We can use that to do forward and backward reasoning. And we also can adapt proofs to go ahead and create new pieces of knowledge as we do more proofs to learn more things.